and Jonathan? It's been ages. I know. Like what? Three days? About three days. <laughs> so make, let's make some news today. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, what was really fascinating um, in our conversation last week, um, to kind of fill you all in, uh, was that we were mapping out what you've been doing. And there's some really intriguing things. Tell us a little bit about the Palo Alto 311. Sure. So um, thrilled to be here. Man, the energy outside is pretty awesome. <laughs> I underestimated the distances between buildings. This is a really, really cool what's happening here. I can't wait to, to explore more. Um, so uh, I, I live and play in the world of uh, sort of practical pragmatism. Um, theory's great, but we do stuff. And, and so, you know, Palo Alto is now the, um, uh, a few years ago was named the number one digital city in America. And, uh, you know, this year we're still within the top five. Um, so what are, what are we doing? What are we doing? So we're experimenting a lot. And cities can experiment and try things. And they're not to the extent they should be. Um, and, and so that's, that would be something that I would say to cities, uh, you know, get on the bandwagon. There's, there's tons to be done. Um, collaborate with startups. Uh, make, make things happen. Uh, you know, so, so one of the things we did, which is not unique, is, uh, but I'll tell you what was unique about it as an extension, is so we have an app in Palo Alto, it's called Palo Alto 311, and you can report issues, right? So you can report if you see a pothole or an abandoned bicycle or a tree uh, branch <coughs> falling off a tree. Um, it, it, it goes to City Hall, an engineer gets it, goes out, fixes the problem. And uh, people love it because it, it holds us accountable, and I think that's really important. You can see when we got the ticket, what we did, and then you can rate the service. Uh, again, um, many more touch points for um, providing good feedback to the city. And, and so we could have stopped there, and many cities do. But instead, we decided to take that data. Imagine all that data. We're getting real-time feedback on the, on the cadence of the city, and we publish it in our open data site, um, mapping it against you know, a, 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 the geographic um, picture of the city. And anyone in the world, including folks here, can go to data.cityofpaloalto.org, and they can see what is happening at any point in the city of Palo Alto at any point in time. Um, that's interesting for people. They can take that data, make apps out of it if they like. But it's really good for us because we can see, hey, we have an issue in the northeast part of the city. We can see that in real time. So we get this complete unique. Um, it's like a city dashboard. It is. And you can map out what's happening inside the city. Yeah. In what, in what ways has that data that you've allowed to be open been used by the developers? Is there any kind of cool things? Well, one of the things from? about open data, which is really unique, is we never find out <laughs> most of the time, right? <laughs> well, why would we? Uh, there's no, like, if, if you are in Dublin or in uh, New York City, wherever it is, and you take our data and you create an amazing app, there's no responsibility to, to tell us about it. Um, sometimes people do, and we love that, so please tell us about it. <laughs> um, but, for example, we published um, uh, we published all our permit data. And we could have, we could have spent the next two, three years building a sort of a, a, an application that people could use to put in their address and see what was happening around them, see what their neighbors were doing if they so choose, choose. to do. And um, <laughs> so instead of building it, we, we made the data available and somebody else built it. And is now they have a commercial product and, and it helps the city and it helps city government. And, and of course, it's really useful to the community. Um, so this is happening over and over again. Um, the, the, the innovation that's required to run cities is now happening more so in the private sector and often between us. Mm. What do you think the role of the citizen is in, in kind of using your app, for example, or uh -huh. um, being part of this connected sort of citizenship? Is there like a goal that citizens will be part of? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's a choice for sure. Um, you know, Tim O'Reilly likes to speak of this idea that, you know, a, a um, Government shouldn't be seen as a vending machine where you stick in a dollar and you get a dollar's worth of service back. Um, that, that model is over. You know, given all the problems and all the complexity and all the needs, um, it's a partnership. Um, I'll tell you one little quick story. So we ran this challenge, this American Idol style challenge, app challenge uh, last year. I played Ryan Seacrest convincingly. <laughs> and um, we, uh, we got uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of participants in that challenge. Um, but one of the data points I was most, most excited about was 30% uh, of the applicants for that particular apps challenge were under 18. Mm. It wasn't the fact that we produced amazing apps or people had a great time. It was that data point that got me most excited. Why is that? Because um, young people have very few ways in which they can get engaged in their community. How they have very few ways in which they can participate in democracy. 
So here all of a sudden was, wow, hey, I can code, or I can learn to code, um, or I can use a, a, an easy you know, um, uh, uh, application to build a, an app, and I can actually contribute to my community. So we had tons of these. Every, they were, I think the youngest was like anything from like 13 onwards, um, suddenly participating in their city. Um, and that's unique. Now the question is, what happens to those people later on? Did we excite them sufficiently that they become future leaders? And, well, I certainly hope so. I think that's a fantastic way of connecting with the citizens and allowing them mm -hmm. a space and also competitions and yes. things to invite them into kind of playing part in deciding what to do with their city. Mm -hmm. I think we've, we've, um, we've got some really good examples of what you've done. I've been reading your book that you gave to me about you know, some of the challenges that you've experienced. What kind of, what kind of things can you suggest to other mm -hmm. um, information officers of, of other cities that, that you've learned along the way that you think would be really beneficial for them to know? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is it, we're at a, an amazing inflection point for government. You know, we, we, uh, first of all, we have half the world moving into cities now, right? We've, we've, uh, we're an urban planet. Over the next uh, 20 years, 30 years, another 2 billion people will, will enter cities. So our future is firmly in cities. And there's an enormous amount of needs not being met, right? Um, you know, people are building stuff for consumers. That's great. People are beginning to build some volume for the enterprise. But nobody's building for cities. And it's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Mm -hmm. if, if you're a developer if right now... If you're interested, then. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> FYI. Um, I, I just think it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's an unmet opportunity. Uh, now, there's, we're beginning to see some VC money flow in that direction, which, uh, you know, if you want to know what's going on, follow the money, and, that's, and, and this is where it's at. So I would say, you know, uh, build solutions. Look for the, the opportunity. Now, you might say, where is the opportunity? It's everywhere. It's replete. Transportation, man, do we have problems, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, if you have the traffic like you have here this morning in a city, <laughs> you shouldn't find that acceptable. You should be really angry about it. And for the first time, we have technology, both hardware and software, um, to begin to really think about how you might solve that problem. The, the challenges of energy and our conversion from a carbon-based uh, planet to a, uh, uh, a renewable, so we're moving to solar, which will be the big push, um, that's going to be incredible, and we'll need a whole set of applications um, and, and um, analytics and intelligence around that. So I, I would just say, wow, is this a space for opportunity, not only for creativity, innovation, but for, uh, for, for making money. So something that I've been working on recently is um, a campaign called Replenish. May yes. I mention this you told to me you? about that. Yeah. Um, so what my background's in economics, and I've got a firm that has been um, developing solutions for the urban environment um, in architecture and urban planning. Mm. And I'm also really fascinated with nature, the yeah. biodiversity, and the way that the environment changes the brain. And I feel that if you connect all of them, there should be a way of reducing the impact of climate change from an anthropogenic manner. Mm -hmm. What do you think, in terms of replenish, could we put into the city as almost like an aim of reducing our impact on the environment, but not reducing the quality of our life in cities and actually improving the regenerative aspects of cities? Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you shared that so much. It's uh, uh, replenish.com? Replenish. Replenishes.org. Dot .org. He should visit it. Very good. Terrific. And uh, yeah, T is leading this movement, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, look, there's, there's tons of ways. The evidence shows that uh, when you have a, uh, a community and agencies focused on health, nature, the environment, uh, things improve for everybody. The economics improve, which is counterintuitive, right? Um, but people's outlook, the health of the city improves. Um, I think we need to really work on, um, uh, first of all, the incentives, right? Not everybody gets it. Not everybody's part of it. So we've got to figure out really clever uh, incentives that appeal to all sorts of different types of people. Um, and the other thing is we need to then present the results. If you make this change, if you make this habit change in your life, uh, what are the results of that? And make it really real. You know, if you choose alternate transport, rather than being one driver alone in a car, if you take public transport, um, if, you, if you cycle or take a mix, uh, what might be the result of that in a very positive way to you, let's say your family, your organization, and, and, and to the city and the world? Um, that's got to be made real for people. If it's not made real, um, people will have a really hard time connecting with it. Some of the challenges that I find um, is that how do you shift this 
kind of typical economy that we live in today to a more circular economy or cradle to cradle thinking yes. where the actions and impacts of those actions on on you know the city yes. is is captured in a way that is beneficial to to those making those decisions so for example if i decide that i'm now going to use public transport instead of taking my car into the city then shouldn't there be some way of of benefiting the citizens for having taken that choice, mm -hmm. which has a long-term important impact on the environment. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I, I think you need it, uh, though the way, human, the way humans think and behave, it's going to benefit them personally as well as outward as well, in, inward and outward. So you've got to do both. Jonathan, that's all we have time for. No way. <laughs> to be <Okay>. continued. <laughs> it was too short, but it thank you so much. Short. You're doing awesome. Thank, thank you, you so very much, much Jonathan. Good luck.